Beginning in May 1990, entertainment will never be the same. That's when you'll play a starring role in an awesome array of attractions based on the greatest motion pictures in Hollywood history. Whether you're soaring through the sky with E.T., rocketing at the speed of light in Back to the Future, or facing the howling, growling fury of King Kong, for the first time, you will feel what it's like to ride the movies. This is Universal Studios Florida, the only studio with 75 years of great movie-making experience behind it. The only studio that will take your imagination and hold it captive for days on end. Universal Studios Florida, premiering in Orlando, May 1990. Come see the stars and ride the movies. Universal Studios Florida has certainly changed over the years since its opening on the 7th of June 1990. There are some beloved rides from the opening or near opening of the park that remain imprinted on long-term fans' hearts and minds. Many of those original attractions have been replaced by newer attractions more recently, but the love and affection for those opening day rides have never faded. In this journey, we will explore the origins of the park's confrontation ride, its impact on the theme park industry, and the reasons for its closure. Prior to opening sites in Orlando, Florida, Universal Studios already had a studio park in Hollywood, California, which featured its own King Kong attraction. In 1986, King Kong Encounter at Universal Studios Hollywood debuted as an addition to the studio back lot tour. At the time, the studio tour was the park's trademark attraction. The tram tour travels through the front lot, back lot and various other attractions, passing sets and properties from movies along the way. During the King Kong encounter portion of the tour, riders traveled through a recreation of Kong's New York Rampage from the 1976 film. The city was already in ruins when you arrived, and TV reports broadcasted Kong's ongoing attack. As events progressed, Kong got closer and closer to the tram. He hurled a helicopter close to the tram, and he even shook a suspension bridge the tram was crossing. Of course, you escaped in the end, but the whole experience was exhilarating. Kong, created by Disney Imaginer Bob Gurr, was the largest animatronic of the time, standing at a massive 30 feet in height. Steven Spielberg was amazed by the intricate animatronic when he saw it under development a few weeks before the attraction debuted. King Kong Encounter was a huge success, increasing tour attendance by 1 million people, to a total of 4.5 million. This success prompted Universal to use a similar attraction in its soon-to-open park in Orlando, but this time they wanted the ride to be a standalone attraction, enhancing the thrills to a whole new level. By October 1987, construction work on Universal Studios Florida was underway by MCA, Universal Studios' parent company and the Blackstone Group, who Universal had formed a joint venture with. The sound stages were due to open in the late summer or early fall of 1988, with the tourist attraction portion forecast opening in late 1989, just months after Disney had opened their latest theme park, MGM Studios. But things eventually progressed more slowly on the theme park site, the strain of producing a host of cutting-edge attractions on a company that lacked Disney's experience had left MCA's project behind schedule, if indeed the original intention of opening in late 1989 had ever been realistic. Instead, MCA was now targeting an opening date exactly one year after Disney on May 1, 1990. Overseeing the project was Bob Ward, Vice President of Design and Planning for MCA Recreational Services. Ward had been involved in the construction of Walt Disney World's Magic Kingdom back in 1971, and was excited about his latest project. Just as in the original plans for Universal Studios Florida, one of those experiences would feature the iconic movie monster, King Kong. Now though, rather than simply being one of a number of set pieces on the studio tour, as in Hollywood, Kong would have his very own attraction, Confrontation, based on the 1976 film version of King Kong. In early 1988, the design process for Kong started, and the attraction was considered to be the crown jewel of Universal Studios Florida. Peter Alexander and Bob Ward, who were co-designers on the Hollywood version of Kong, worked on developing the storyline. King Kong is not just a ride, we're going to put you in the movie. You are cast as the actor. 
In this case, you're cast as frantic New Yorkers, typical frantic New Yorkers, and you are fleeing Kong's rampage. As he rampages across New York City, you got to get away. So what you do is you're going to escape. You're going to get into the Roosevelt Island aerial tramway and take off into the sky. Now you think you're going to be safe. Your guide tells you, you know, Kong's not in the area. But as soon as you round the first corner, you'll see that Kong has been there in front of you. You see a New York City street scene. And something big and something mean has already been there. And cop cars are turned over and fire hydrants are broken off. There's a crash L train at the end of the track. And then you'll hear a sound. <laughs> And you'll see a helicopter searchlight going through the facades of the buildings. And Kong is caught in that silhouette. And you'll see him wave at the helicopter, and he can't get it. It makes him mad. And as you sail into the Roosevelt Island tram station, he's going to reach out his hand and pick up your car. And he's looking for a nice, tasty morsel inside, maybe the, the lady in the third row there or something like that. And he's going to throw you down. And you're going to sail down. Ah, we're a 70-foot portion. You're getting closer and closer and closer and closer and closer to the ground. At the last moment, the cable holding you stretches to its tautest moment, and boing, you're safe. Interestingly, Ward found inspiration for one of the key scenes in a 1981 film called Nighthawks, starring Sylvester Stallone and Rutger Hauer. The scene involved the hijacking of a cable car on the Roosevelt Island Tramway, which is an aerial tram that runs alongside New York's 59th Street Bridge. This proved to be a pivotal moment in the development of the attraction as Ward suggested that guests could ride their own tram car on the attraction while being terrorized by Kong in the process. In terms of the technology used to bring Kong to life, the animatronic figures were created using knowledge gained from the development of the Hollywood attraction. This ensured that the Kong figures were incredibly lifelike and believable, which only added to the overall impact of the ride. And to top it all off, at the end of the ride, guests would discover that they had actually been filmed and were now starring in a brand new King Kong movie. It was an amazing experience that truly captured the essence of the King Kong story. However, whereas guests in Hollywood passed by Kong in the standard studio tour trams, confrontation would require a completely new, custom ride system, one that would convince riders that they were being picked up and thrown. Alexander approached two well-known manufacturers of amusement rides to come up with designs for the system. Swiss firm in Tamman designed a vehicle suspended by cables at each of its four corners whilst the other theme park manufacturer, Arrow Development, opted for a device similar to an accordion's bellows that sat atop the 50-passenger tram car. Arrow's design won the day. To achieve the thrilling finale, both the Kong figures and the tram vehicles had to work together seamlessly. Kong's hands would be positioned under the tram car, which meant that the animatronic systems had to be in perfect synchronization with the vehicle control system. It took months of careful fine-tuning to get everything just right, as it was crucial to ensure that Kong's hand would not inadvertently hit any of the guests. It was a challenging feat, but the end result was an incredible experience that left guests in awe. Alexander was very hands-on in advancing the Kong project, and he wasn't afraid to get personally involved. In order to determine the optimal speed for dropping the tram, a test rig was created. Alexander volunteered to be the test subject and was dropped at full free fall before being stopped just a few feet from the ground. Unfortunately, he ended up requiring a double hernia operation as a result of the experiment. Following this incident, the team decided to tone down the fall and make adjustments to ensure the safety of all guests. Despite the setback, Alexander's dedication and willingness to go above and beyond helped bring the Kong attraction to life. Kong's famous banana breath effect was also brought over from the Hollywood attraction, but it was now more sophisticated than the rotting coat used in the original demo by Gurr. Alexander's father, an aerospace engineer, came up with a clever solution to enhance the effect. He suggested using an impeller, which is the rotating part of a centrifugal pump or compressor, to blast the smell at the riders. To create the banana scent, the team obtained banana juice from a fragrance seller who provided it in a small device. The scent was held until the moment when Kong's mouth opened, and then a burst of it was sprayed towards the riders. It was a clever and innovative solution that added an extra layer of immersion to the experience, making it even more memorable for guests. King Kong at Universal Studios Hollywood was already terrifying enough for visitors, but for confrontation, the attraction's designers took it even further. The Totally Fun Company and MCA Planning and Development collaborated on the project, and their plans called for two Kong figures that would be a staggering 39 feet tall, with an arm span of 54 feet. The first figure, which guests would encounter in the street, would weigh a massive 13,000 pounds. The second figure was slightly lighter at 8,000 pounds but more agile. 
To accommodate these colossal creatures, the soundstage show building had to be six stories high and cover an area of about 62,000 square feet. The result was a truly epic experience that left guests in awe of the sheer size and scale of the attraction. Forced perspective techniques would be used to give the appearance that large swathes of New York had been crammed inside the soundstage, with jet black curtains hiding the horizon so that riders would not know how far off the ground they really were. Fifty facades were installed to create the impression that guests were passing through and over Manhattan's Lower East Side. The helicopters used in the showdown scene with Kong was molded from a real helicopter and were full-sized. At the time of its creation, Confrontation was the most ambitious attraction ever undertaken by Universal Studios at that point, fusing movie-quality sets, enormous animatronic creatures, and a bespoke ride system. Peter Alexander, who was instrumental in the attraction's development, continued to be involved with it even after Universal Studios Florida opened. His voice, pitched down, was used as the sound of Kong's roar, solidifying his contribution to the project. On June 7, 1990, Universal Studios Florida opened its doors to the public with a ribbon-cutting ceremony from Steven Spielberg. Actors like Michael J. Fox and Sylvester Stallone were also in attendance. Universal Studios Florida's opening day featured 13 rides and shows, not counting the Boneyard, the Marx Brothers, and other lineless attractions. These attractions were, Alfred Hitchcock, The Art of Making Movies, Animal Actors, Dynamite Night's Stunt Spectacular, Earthquake, The Big One, E.T. Adventure, The Fantastic World of Hanna-Barbera, Ghostbusters Spooktacular, Jaws, Confrontation, Murder She Wrote Mystery Theater, Nickelodeon Studios, The Phantom of the Opera Horror Makeup Show and the production Tram Tour. According to the Orlando Sentinel's front-page story about the big grand opening, the three big rides were largely unavailable throughout the day. Even the E.T. Adventure was reported to have intermittent technical difficulties, along with a two-hour wait time. Alexander, however, recalled that the situation wasn't as bleak as it seemed. Attractions in the front half of the park, including the fantastic world of Hanna-Barbera Motion Simulator, Ghostbusters Spooktacular and Alfred Hitchcock shows, were operating normally on that first day. He attributed Confrontation's closure to safety concerns, saying that the talkback system that interfaced the computers that controlled the 39-foot-tall King Kong animatronics with those controlling the ride vehicle wasn't working. Theoretically, Kong could stick his finger into the ride vehicle and poke somebody out the other side, which wouldn't have been good, Alexander said. Earthquake had programming issues two weeks before opening, Alexander remembered. Producer Larry Lester had barely gotten the ride to function at all by June 7th, and it only began operating on a limited basis by the afternoon of the park's second day. However, the $30 million Jaws ride had much deeper problems. Alexander himself had developed the original ride storyline, including the section where the shark appeared to actually grab the boat with his teeth. It was then up to ride show engineering to make the ride system work. Alexander said elements of the attraction worked in tests for months, but very rarely did all the pieces work together. Everything broke down one after the other, Alexander said. It was impossible to get the whole ride to run and when it did run, it wasn't very good. The problems didn't get solved overnight. Confrontation had its opening delayed until August 4, 1990, nearly two months after the grand opening. Universal eventually sued Ride Show Engineering over the Jaws ride, claiming the company had placed non-waterproof parts underwater, causing the constant failures in ride elements. The suit was settled for an undisclosed amount the following year, but Ride Show insisted the real problem was that Universal didn't allow enough time for testing. Basically, Universal didn't have any experience with a ride like this, Rideshow CEO Edward Foyer told the Orlando Sentinel in October 1993. If we had built something like this for Disneyland, Disneyland maintenance would have taken it over and made it work. Eventually, Jaws suffered the most extreme fate of the opening day trio, after Universal spent much of 1991 trying to salvage the original version of the attraction, it was rebuilt almost from scratch, with the new version opening in 1993. Perhaps learning from the past mistakes, Universal allowed more than 500,000 guests to experience technical rehearsals of the ride for three months before it officially opened. Downtime at the park's three biggest attractions did not go unnoticed by opening day guests. According to the front page story in The Sentinel from June 8, 1990, the most popular attraction that day may have been the guest relations desk, with about 1,000 visitors demanding refunds. 
From opening day and throughout the summer, as technical difficulties and delays continued, Universal placated angry guests with a two-for-one ticket deal, offering free passes for anyone who bought a ticket and entered the park throughout its first summer. Confrontation was a massive success for Universal Studios Florida. It quickly became one of the park's most popular attractions and drew large crowds every day. Confrontation also had a significant impact on the theme park industry. It showed that rides could be more than just passive experiences and that guests could be immersed in a story and actively participate in it. Unfortunately, confrontation was not destined to last forever. On August 15, 2002, Universal Studios Florida announced that the ride would be closing to make way for a new attraction based on the movie, Revenge of the Mummy. There has never been a reason given by Universal for the closure, although it is speculated that high staffing, operations and maintenance costs were the main reasons. However, Universal Studios Florida saw the closure as an opportunity to bring something new and exciting to the park. The new attraction, Revenge of the Mummy, was a huge success and is still one of the park's most popular rides today. Shortly after confrontation closed, Universal Orlando began construction on its replacement, Revenge of the Mummy, a state-of-the-art indoor roller coaster. All of the New York City interior was leveled to make way for the large speed sections of the mummy, and the facade was transformed into the Museum of Antiquities from the first mummy film. On May 21, 2004, Revenge of the Mummy opened to the general public with a grand ceremony hosted by Brendan Fraser, the actor who played Rick O'Connell in the mummy films. As with most park projects that replace old attractions, Universal likes to keep a hint or two to remember the past. In the queue for Mummy, now an ancient tomb rather than a subway, sharp-eyed guests can spot banana hieroglyphics adorning the walls and confrontation coins on tables. The most famous Easter egg to confrontation lies in the treasure room sequence of the ride. When the lights shine in the room, revealing a mass of gold and treasure, on the left-hand side a small gold statue of King Kong can be seen high up in the corner. One hint to the old ride that guests cannot see is the original track that held the cable cars up from the ceiling of the soundstage. Remnants of the old track are still attached to the ceiling in the dark speed sections of the mummy. Fortunately, after many years of being non-existence from the parks, the king has returned. After the success of the Kong 363D attraction in Hollywood, rumors swirled about Kong making a comeback to Orlando. Those rumors were fueled even more when Universal began construction on a mystery attraction adjacent to Jurassic Park in Islands of Adventure. Then on May 6, 2015, Universal announced that King Kong would finally be returning to Universal Orlando in the summer of 2016 with the opening of an all-new attraction at Islands of Adventure called Skull Island, Reign of Kong. Although this ride is far superior in technology, and is now set in Kong's home rather than New York, there are still some similarities to confrontation. The ride vehicles are more or less the same tram style, albeit this time an off-road truck with a driver, the ending of the attraction with a massive three-story tall animatronic Kong, is certainly a callback to the classic finale of the old ride for sure. Even though Confrontation closed more than 20 years ago, Confrontation in its day was a groundbreaking attraction that pushed the boundaries of what a theme park ride could be. It was also a technological marvel, a thrilling experience, and a beloved part of Universal Studios Florida's history. The ride paved the road for large-scale animatronic figures and was certainly an influence for figures like the Yeti at Disney's Animal Kingdom and even the T-Rex at the end of Jurassic Park River Adventure. More than that, Kong was the headline attraction for Universal Studios Florida when it opened to the public, and now all these years later, Kong, once again reigns supreme at Universal Orlando. While the original confrontation ride may be gone, it will never be forgotten by those who experienced its wonder and magic, and I for one, have still got many vivid memories of riding this amazing ride, and remember so clearly my first experience riding Kong, as it completely blew me away. And now, let me share with you some of my confrontation home movies I recorded from back in the day. Enjoy!
also being escorted by National Guard helicopters, so we asked there's no lit videotaping or flash photography. My name is Mike. It's my job to safely evacuate into your evacuation shelter.